بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله I want to welcome everyone to Conversations and today I have a very very special guest someone that I'm so excited to be speaking with uh, Coach Faraz Zahabi Salam Allah alaykum Zakal Khair Thank you very much Salam to everybody out there uh, Ramadan Mubarak First thing I want to Ramadan say to you Ramadan Mubarak Thank you very much and to you and everybody all the listeners out there fasting Ramadan Mubarak Allah Mubarak You know Coach Faraz Subhanallah I don't think you know how much of impact you've had in my life <laughs> Really? Yeah, and even though this is the first time, this is the two of us actually sitting down and meeting and talking. Mm -hmm. uh, SubhanAllah, you got my family into MMA. Really? Uh, Wallah, you got my... Uh, you got maybe my... it's not a good thing, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll, we'll talk about that because my 16-year-old wants to be a boxer. So really? Okay. I, I need you to deprogram him. Yeah, yeah, a little bit, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but you know, SubhanAllah, I was listening to a lot, of, uh, a lot of your information on the internet. I mean, first, I'll start by saying this to all of our listeners. You have to uh, follow Coach Faraz's YouTube page. Sajad, can you bring up the YouTube page so we can show it? Uh, TriStar, TriStar Gym. You can scroll down a little bit, Sajad. Uh, one of the amazing things, there's a lot of fighting information here for everyone, but one of the great things that Coach Faraz does in his live podcast sessions, he takes questions about everything and anything. And they are great life-based advice for the whole family, for my kids. My kids and I listen to it, and so it's wonderful information. Uh, Coach Faraz, barakallahu feek for doing that. Thank you very much. Pleasure. So, uh, Coach Faraz, uh, lots of topics that we want to get into today, and of course, MMA and you know, training is going to be one of them. But uh, the issue, the topic that's heavy on all Muslims' hearts, probably on your heart, my heart, is mm -hmm. the issue of Gaza and what's been happening in Gaza. We're about 160 days in. Mm -hmm. What we're referencing is the Gazan genocide. And I just want to play a clip here about uh, what's happening in Gaza and the resolve of the Gazan people, and then you and I can discuss and talk about it. Sajad, if you bring up that clip. Here, Coach Faraz, what our viewers are seeing as well, the Ghazan people, the mosques have been bombed out, and they're still praying tarawih. MashaAllah. Uh, Coach Faraz, give me, give me your thoughts. Honestly, it's incredibly moving. This is historic. It's historic. People will remember this for decades to come. This mm -hmm. is being documented. This is the first genocide ever being documented. There's there's never been one like this on it of its kind to be documented on social media on a daily basis. You're seeing you're seeing it happen live in front of your eyes, and people always say, "Oh, I don't understand how people in Germany went along with this crazy Nazi ideology," and yet we're doing it today again. And history repeats itself, and there's a lot of psychology behind this. There's a lot of psychology on both sides of the fence, but I remember the image of a of a child throwing a rock at a tank, mm. and and. This that image will it was it's burned in our memories forever. But this this is another one of those images. They have no food. They have no water. They have no shelter. They're being murdered on a daily basis. They're they're blockaded inside a prison. These these images we're seeing now are going to be historical images that will live on forever. And it's incredible how how the the heart of the palestinian the heart of the muslim palestinian how they are so brave how they're so strong i'll tell you something i i watch the news every morning i go to bed at night i watch the, what's happening in palestine and i can tell you something anytime i have something tough in my life i tell myself oh think of what the palestinians are going through don't you even dare complain this is tough don't you i i, I i'm i'm humble to see how strong they are mashallah how strong they are, how their will is so incredibly strong and um i'm amazed by them yeah, you know, Coach Faraz, for me, I think, you know, for the Muslim community, uh, there's we've gone through so many different emotions, you know, watching this. But then the Ghazan people themselves, and you can imagine the emotions that they're going through, are just increasing in their resolve of faith. And so, you know, here we are, you know, I'm, I'm in uh, Columbia, Maryland, you're in uh, Montreal, mm -hmm. Canada, and uh, Tarawih time comes and we're thinking, oh, I'm tired, should I go mm -hmm. pray? Mm -hmm. And then you see images like this. Mm -hmm. it's it's incredible honestly this these kind of images will live on forever it's the first of its kind you know uh, i mean people are debating whether it's a holocaust or not we have historians we have even jewish historians calling it a ho holocaust there's a definition to holocaust we we weren't using that term before october 
we're using that term now. You know, people are saying, oh, they increased in population. That was before October. We're talking now. The population is decreasing greatly. Now, people are dying. People are being displaced. This is a genocide happening live. The whole world. I'm ashamed of the entire world. That all the world leaders, I'm ashamed of them. There's not one world leader I'm not ashamed of. They have to come together and come to a resolve. Now, with that said, you know, I'm also, I'm, and I, I think we have to be honest as well. Hamas didn't do any favors for the Palestinians. And I'm going to get into the thick of it quite early. Because I saw October, October 7th. When October 7th happened, I had a podcast and I condemned, I condemned uh, the killing of innocent civilians. And it shouldn't be hard for a Muslim to do that. It shouldn't even be hard to roll that off the tongue because it's explicit in the Quran. If you kill one innocent person, it's like you killed all of humanity. That's how serious killing an innocent life is in Islam. And in Islam, we have rules of engagement. They're explicit. They're not, uh, you don't have to be a, a scholar to understand. They're very, very explicit and simple. If they cease, you cease. If they cease their aggression, you cease. That's for combatives. That's for a combatant, excuse me. If you're fighting a combatant and he lays down his weapon and he surrenders, you cease fighting. That's for a combatant. Imagine an innocent life. Now, when October 7th happened, there was the claim of 40 beheaded children or slash babies. Okay, mm -hmm. There was interchange in what words was used. Let's try to be as precise as possible here. When I heard the President of the United States say he saw pictures, images of 40 beheaded children slash babies, because the, both terms were used throughout the media. An hour or so later, the the White House had recanted that statement, but they did it in a little post, you know, a little blog or whatever, the, you know, how they release information. But it went viral on the internet. Now, I, I was thinking, if it's on the lips of the President of the United States, I mean, he has the CIA, he has the FBI, he has all the intelligence of the world cooperating with him. I took it, I took his word for it. So I went on my podcast and I was like, you know what, this is unacceptable. This is absolutely doesn't do any service to Islam. This is not a completely Islamic. I condemn them. I'm I'm glad to report there wasn't 40 beheaded babies because children are innocent. They should never be involved in war. They should never be involved. They should never be victims of war. Now, anytime they say something, I gotta take it with a grain of salt. I want I, I want proof. I want very strong proof. I'm super super adamant about having proof on both sides. Of course, we have to be fair. Muslim always has to be fair. <clears throat> I'll tell you something. I did do my research, and there's not a lot of research on it. I'm telling you, there's not a lot of uh, information available on exactly what happened on October 7th. Okay, mm -hmm. there's no, there, there's a little mini documentary that was released. I'm not sure if it's authenticity, how strong it is, but you you do see GoPro footage. What I would say is not made up; it's real, and you see some uh, atrocities, killing people who are running away, etc. Um, and I hear excuses from Muslims. Muslims are going to be like, well, they're IDF, but they're off-duty, they're reservists, etc. You don't know that for certain, and they're running away. And they're seeking shelter. You're not supposed to, in Islam, you cannot attack even a non-combatant, even a combatant who's seeking shelter, who's who's not aggressing you. For those who are not familiar with uh, Islamic conquests, yes, Islam had conquests. They fought other governments, but they never fought people. They never murdered people. They never established colonies in territories of the people. This is something, this is a nuance that's very different than other co colonies, okay? Islam might have, might wage war with a government, but never innocent people. Actually, most people throughout history embraced Islam. It was a cheaper tax. It was a cheaper tax for them. The Jizya is a much cheaper tax than what the Persians were wearing, uh, paying, etc. You know, historians still argue today of how Islam expanded so fast. They still argue what made the expansion so great, so easy, so fast, so, so quick, such a small number of people taking over such a vast a powerful, uh, a vast amount of land. That's a topic for another day. But waging war against the government is very different than, than waging war against the people. The president of Israel, the president, because Israel has a PM and a president. He said, we have to get away, at the beginning of the war, he says, we have to get away with this rhetoric of innocent civilians. He's trying to tell people, no, there's no innocent civilian. They should have done a coup. This is, this is what he's claiming. Mm. They should have done a coup if they if they want to. This is pure insanity. If we hold anybody to the standard, then everybody's a terrorist. Everybody's a criminal. Everybody's a criminal. I just saw a video of a young boy holding up a firework and was shot in the heart by an IDF soldier. Now, the IDF soldier was 100 meters away in a tower, literally in a tower, behind, the, behind a giant wall in a giant tower, safe as can be. 
He saw ch children playing with fireworks. They're bored. They live in a prison. He's literally holding up a little firework, a little tiny little firework. And the idea of so this happened just a few days ago. Shot him in the heart, killed him. Itamar Ben Gavir went on TV and said that he's going to organize to reward that soldier with a medal. And he says, you see, a Ben Gavir said these words, not me. I'm not putting words in his mouth. He said, you see a 12-year-old boy, I see a 12-year-old terrorist. If we're going to start holding each other to this standard, what's the difference between their logic now and Ham Hamas logic or any other terrorist you want, any other group you want to call terrorist? They say that, hey, you know, on on 9-11, you know, we ask, why did you kill civilians? You know, it's haram. Oh, well, you know, they support their government. They don't fight against... That's the exact same logic now that they're using. This is haram logic, of course. This is haram, 100% haram. It's inconsistent logic. This is khawarij logic. This is completely extreme. This is not in the Quran. It's not in the Hadith. It's opposite. It's the polar opposite to Quran and Hadith. Yet they use this logic. Well, you killed our civilians. We're going to kill your civilians. And it's eye for an eye. No, this is incorrect. This is completely incorrect. You have to combat the government, yes. The soldiers, yes. The, the military resistance, yes. Never innocent people. If it's the case, we're going to accept these standards. Today. If people are going to come out and make excuses, that means we're all fair game. That means humanity might just massacre one another uh, at will. Yeah, Coach Fraz, I mean, I think you're bringing up lots of points that we need to discuss and have conversations about. Number one is it goes back to the model of Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa ala alayhi and his actions. I feel like very often the Muslim community, we get very caught up in our emotions and mm -hmm. those things that we feel. And then we act based on those emotions, not looking back at the perfected model in which Allah tells us, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا that in him, alayhi salatu wasalam, is the perfected model for everyone. And he, alayhi salatu wasalam, went through everything. <clears throat> There's nothing that we're seeing happening nowadays except for the Prophet sallallahu ta'ala, alayhi wa ala, alayhi, suffered through it, or he enjoyed it, alayhi salatu wasalam, and he gave us the perfect model as to what to do in those times. But when it comes to the Palestinian people and the issue of Hamas and the tactics, I mean, as you said, there's a psychology for the oppressor, and there's a psychology of the oppressed. Now, if we're in Gaza, and we feel that the whole world, this is before October 7th, has turned its back on us. And we have no future. And we don't have any partners that are willing to engage us in any way that can give us a glimmer, just a glimmer of hope. What do you do as a resident? Look, I, I, I sympathize with people who are living in this situation of the, to the, like the Palestinians. When the colonialists came and they they attacked the Native Americans. They displaced them. They punished them. They they murdered them. Would you side with the colonialists? I personally wouldn't. Of course not. When, when the British invaded India, I wouldn't have sided with the colonialists. They didn't fight governments. They fought the people. They subjugated the people. When the blacks were enslaved, would you side with the Europe, the the American, the, the American and European slave owners? I wouldn't. Whether they're Muslim or not, I won't side with them. By the way, in Islam, slavery is only by POW, only by prisoner of war, never by abduction of freedom. Even though some Muslims did this throughout history, this is haram. There's only one way for somebody to be uh, a prisoner, uh, excuse me, a, a slave. We should use the term more POW because it's only one way you can be taken into slavery. There's only one way, and that's if you're a prisoner of war, POW, because what can we do with you? Back then, we didn't have prisons. Okay, In the 7th century, there were no prisons. This is the lesser of two evils. Okay, now today we have a prison system. We no longer in Islam we have a, we've abolished slavery. Slavery doesn't exist. It's no longer a necessary evil. That's a separate topic for another day. Okay, I can't do it justice here. That's a separate topic for another day. The topic today is people are being radicalized. Why? How do you radicalize a human being? This is why I I objected so strongly against Jordan Peterson. Jordan Peterson after October seventh he tweeted he tweeted to. Netanyahu, give him hell. Now, I'll never forgive him for this tweet. He's inciting violence on a people he knows have been radicalized. How do you radicalize it? He's a psychologist. He knows how to radicalize a human being. If, you know, in Abraham Maslow, they call him the father of psychology. There's a hierarchy of human needs. 
you need warmth, food, water, shelter, security. These are the most basic needs. If I take away these, these needs of yours, every human will break. There's no human over time that will not break. If I take away your, your desire for security, food, water, and, and Israel did it all. They regulated the amount of foods. They don't allow them pure water. 8% of the water in Gaza was undrinkable before October 7th. Your children are getting diseases. Why? Because the Israelis won't allow you purification tablets. They won't allow you to have a water purification system. They, they want you to leave. They hate you. They want you to leave. They, they're literally making you live in the world's biggest open-air prison. They don't allow you any freedoms. If you have a cancer and you have to go to get medical, if you have a cancer, if you live in Gaza and you have a cancer and you need a, you need a life-saving saving treatment, you have to pass through checkpoints. When you pass through checkpoints, you're at the whim of the soldier. He could just turn you back. You're at the whim of the soldier who was born to hate Palestinians, by the way. Like they say, oh, they radicalized the youth in, the, in Gaza. They radicalized the youth in Israel. I, I dare anybody to find me a material difference or ideological difference between the two extreme governments. I believe Hamas is an extreme government, but I also believe Israel has an extreme government and Israel Israeli government is worse. And we're going we're gonna to say, okay, well, you know, only the most naive people think this war started October 7th. Only the most naive. If you start the story there, you're too naive for even this discussion right now. I'm not going to go that basic. Okay. We have to talk about who threw the first punch. Well, you know, I threw a punch on October 7th. You threw a punch on October 1st. And then he threw a punch on, in November. And we're going to go back. Who threw the first punch? Look, you know, I'll tell you all who threw the first punch. The Palestinians never had a significant conflict in their history. <clears throat> They never had a significant, they're a peaceful, relatively peaceful people. You never heard about them in the news. In 1948, look, dig up the dig up the newspapers from the 1940s. The British were writing the Jewish terrorists, the Israeli terrorists blew up King, uh, King David Hotel. The Israeli terrorists attacked us. The Israeli terrorists, they were known as a terrorist group. The founder, the first prime minister was known as a terrorist group. His group was known as a terrorist group. He later became prime minister. He later became the first prime minister. They were a terrorist group. They invaded, they colonized, they took people's homes by force. Now, when I immigrated to this country in Canada, my parents didn't come here with guns. They didn't blow pe people up. We're Muslims. We came here. Yes, we came here in hordes. How did we come here? We took menial jobs. We worked our fingers to the bone. We paid rent. We saved money. We bought homes. And now today we own businesses. And now today we vote. And now today we're we're prominent, prominent members of our society, law-abiding prominent members of society. We didn't come here and put anybody. Uh, we didn't kick. We didn't murder or kill or kick out anybody. That's how the Jews should have came. Because I'll tell you something, Ahlan Salan, We welcome the Jews. We'll talk about the history of the Muslims and the Jews. The Jews always were welcome in Muslim worlds. Always, the golden age of Judaism was under Islamic rule. The highest, most successful. Propagation of propagation of Judaism. Maimonides, the greatest Jewish thinker of all time, lived in a Muslim world. He wrote in Arabic. Like today, I, I write in English. I write in English. I'm if I if if I see if the Zahabis, my family, see a golden age. Well, you know, I can't blame. I can't say that the the crown, the European crown, didn't give me the chance. They did. I'll tell you something. I don't fight the government here. Why? They allow me all the freedoms I need to live a life. The Palestinians need the same thing. If I was treated like the Palestinians are treated by Israel, if I was treated by Canada like the Palestinians were treated by Israel, I would have done exactly what they did. I would have been just as radicalized. And if anybody, if anybody disagrees with this, allow me to deal you the death blow. I'll deal you the death blow. Look at how irony, look at the poetic justice you're about to hear now here. Okay. Hamas comes from the word zealot. The word zealot comes from a group of Jewish rebels that rebelled against Rome. Rome was quite evil to the Jews. They invaded Jewish territory. They subjugated the Jewish people. Caesar wanted to put a statue of himself in the Jewish temple. When the Romans entered Jerusalem, they were mystified, trying to understand what the Jews were worshiping. Now, if you don't know about uh, Temple Judaism, First Temple Judaism, Second Temple Judaism, they have a curtain. And, and there they say dwells the Spirit of God. Okay. Now, of course, if you draw the curtain, there's no statue, there's no idolatry, it's haram for the Jews as well. We're very similar. The Jews and the Muslims are incredibly similar. We, we both 
trace our genealogy, genealogies to Abraham alayhi salam. We're brothers. We're blood brothers. We're half brothers. Now, the Romans came and they were mystified. What are you worshiping exactly? Well, we worship one God. It was mystifying to them. One God. Who's your connection to God? No, we don't. We don't have a saint. We don't have any intermediaries. We pray directly to God. It was paradigm shifting to the Romans. Well, the Romans said, look, we don't really care about religion. As long as you kiss the ring of the Roman emperor, we're going to put a statue of him here. They rebelled. The, the Jews rebelled. Now you had a split in the Jewish community. Some said, look, let's work with the Romans. Let's try to have a coexistence, etc. But you had a group called the Zealots. And they said, the Zealots were also referred to as a, a Sakari, okay? Because they, they carried a particular sword or knife. I would say a dagger, not a, not a sword, a dagger is shorter. It's a short blade. The zealots, the Sakari, Hamas of the first century were Jews who rebelled against Rome. And you know, this group also would kill any Jewish person who would even negotiate with Romans. Their entire, their entire movement was about complete eradication of the Roman government, ex expelling the Romans completely out of our borders. Very similar to what we hear Hamas say in their first charter. They want to expel them completely. They don't want a Roman government here. We are a Jewish people. We're unique to our to this to this uh, holy land, and we're going to defend it to the death. Now, suffice it to say, the zealots were expelled. The temple was burned. But they were. Don't forget that I skipped a massive part. the The Romans regularly crucified Jews. They tortured them. Okay, they tortured them. We had the Romans were not friendly to the Jews. They subjugated them. They want to take away their religious freedom. They want to take away their temple. Lo and behold, they burned the temple in the year 70. In the year 70, the Roman the Romans burned the temple of the Jews. The Jews are expelled. Now I want to ask you a question. Who returned the Jews after 500 years of expulsion? Yes, there was always a small amount of Jews in Jerusalem, always, but a very small amount. We're talking about 1% here. Who brought them back? It was the Muslims. After 500 years later, fast forward about 500 years later, over 500 years later, Omar bin Khattab, anhu, he conquers Jerusalem peacefully. And he asks, where is the temple of the Jews? When they showed him the temple of the Jews, it was a modern day dump site. Why? Because the Romans wanted to throw their garbage. Not only they burned the temple, they threw their garbage into the temple. What did Omar bin Khattab, anhu, what did he do? He started to remove the garbage with his own hands. Think about the Khalifa, the most powerful man in the world at the time. Not only he removed the garbage with his own hand, the Sahaba cleaned out the temple. He brought back the Jews. He brought 70 families. Why only 70? Because the Christians protested to even having 70. There was a lot of politics to study in that time. But we, the Muslims, always brought back the Jews to Jerusalem. We always sheltered the, the Jews from the Spanish Inquisitions the genocides that were the, the the pogroms who the ottoman empire sent ships to spain to bring back jews from spain when when the catholics conquered spain we lived in peace with the jews in spain but then the, the catholics came and conquered spain christianity went to a, a dark period where they want to kill every jew read the writings of martin luther not martin luther king i have a dream martin luther the founder of protestant religion Martin Luther King, I have a dream. Martin Luther King Jr. I have a dream, Martin Luther King Jr. He was named after Martin Luther, the founder of the Protestant religion. Read what he says about the Jews. He condemns them. He says we should, you know what, to them all. Burn every... If, if, you, can't, if you can't burn their structures that they built, bury them. Like he was very anti-Semitic. Who sheltered, who sheltered the Jews from Roman Catholic... And Protestant wrath, it was always the Muslim lands. Case in point, Maimonides, the greatest Jewish scholar, the man who wrote literally wrote the book on what it is to be a Jew. The second Moses, the Rambam, he lived safely in Islamic rule. Islam, there was never a genocide. And I'm quoting Rabbi Shmuley here, the biggest Zionist voice in the world today. The worst. He says, there was never 
a Holocaust in the Islamic world. Actually, you know what? I'm going to play it for your audience if you don't mind. Yeah, it's, a 30, send, it's a 15 second clip. If, if, I, if you send me the clip, we'll get it up on. We'll get it I up would on. love. I would love for you to play this. You know, because this this video should go viral. Yeah, this what, video should go viral. What's happened to me? And we'll get it. Up I'm gonna. What's happened to you right now? Give me one second. I won't be long. I'll take your time. And. Um, yeah, this is all fascinating information that we haven't. It's just been, you know, the wool has been put over the world's eyes, uh, you know, through this, um, you know, the the media to think that the Muslims were the ones that are constantly attacking the the Jews. The Muslims were the ones that were constantly pulling out them out of their lands. It's quite the opposite. That's the reality of the situation. We'll bring this clip up. Yep, got it. One second. <clears throat> Gonna send it over to Sajad. Who all, all our recent, all our conflicts are very recent. Most of our conflicts. Look, I'm not, I'm not trying to say that our relationship was perfect throughout history. No, no, we had ups and downs. But compared to the rest of the world, we, we, we get along with the Jewish people, and we will get along with Jewish people. Like, like black and whites get along today. Like, if you, if you went back in the height, in the, in the peak of slavery, and you said, no, one day a black man and a white man will be neighbors, they wouldn't believe you. They would say, no, it's impossible. We're, we're forever at odds. We're too different. We'll never incorporate. And don't forget, Muslims forget, who are the first anti-racists in history? The first anti-racist in history was Muhammad alayhi salam. And we don't get we don't get enough, we don't get enough recognition for that. Still, just a few hundred years ago, they were still racist. They still think white man and black man can't get along, they can't live together. A black man and a, and a white woman can't be married, they can't have children. Like still, it took them way over, they took them well over a hundred, uh, it took them well over a thousand years to catch up to us. We're going to bring up the clip right now. Let's play. This Please clip. go ahead. How, how do you regard the breakdown of communities? And for example, how do you how do you regard you know Islam in the Muslim world nowadays? It's been very negatively stereotyped. Well, look, I'm actually interestingly enough, as an Orthodox Jew, a great champion of Islam. The fact is that the Jewish community has a real debt to the Islamic community, because when we were kicked out of Catholic Spain in 1492, when we were kicked out of Catholic Portugal, I think in 1503. It was the Muslims who took the Jews in. That's why there are Jewish communities in the Islamic world till this very day. The Islamic community, the Jewish community of Istanbul dates from then. Um, it, was, it was specifically um, countries uh, not beyond the Ottoman Empire where Jews were tolerated uh, and they were welcomed in. And they, they, played, they paid a jizya. There was a poll tax they paid, but they were never persecuted. And there wasn't a Holocaust in the Islamic world. The fact is the Jews and Muslims have so much in common. And let me just tell you, there isn't a conflict outside of the Middle East very often I meet Muslims here in the United States and my first expression to them is one of sympathy. Like, just no, don't, people don't think that people, God forbid, look down at you. I honor you for celebrating your faith. Let me do shalom on home. How, how do you In incredible that this is the same man. Coach Faraz, please, your thoughts. Well, you know, he's, he's a prominent um, uh, Zionist voice and he believes that everybody who says anything remotely negative or criticizes Israel is an anti uh, anti semitic which is untrue you know i mean we can't hold, we can't have any nation be outside of criticism every nation is human uh, we can't hold them to uh, being untouchable we can't you know it, it, it's an absurdity the violence going on today is just bloodlust it doesn't protect. Look, by by bombing Gazans the way they're doing, they're making Israel more unstable. They're making the region more unstable. October seventh, if tomorrow the Hamas gathered all its might and tried to re produce another October seventh, they couldn't do it. They got caught. They got caught sleeping at the wheel. Look, I I agree that killing non, like killing innocent civilians is haram. I I I, I can utterly condemn it. If Hamas went in there and fought only military combatants, if they attacked strategic points, if they showed that look. We're here. We're fighting you. We're not accepting our situation. I would have been completely on their side on that day. I would have said, look, you're correct. You can fight military combatants. That's your oppressor. You can look him in the eye and fight him. Would you blame uh, a, 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 a black man, a black slave for fighting his white slave owner? No, you wouldn't. I wouldn't, I wouldn't blame those who are colonized to fight the colonizer. But randomly, you know, we saw some atrocities. And some people tell me, oh, those are just a few bad apples. Well, then Hamas has to come and bring them to justice. Hamas has to condemn them. Say, because you know Hamas leader said, "Oh no, we didn't kill any innocent civilians." Sorry, there's footage that says the complete contrary. Complete. Yeah, the Islamic heroes that we had, like Omar Mukhtar, radiallahu anhu, who led the the Libyan uh, freedom fighters against the Italian occupation, the likes of uh, Amir Abdul Qadir al Jazairi, rahmatullahi alayhi, who led the uh, the Algerians against the uh, French. Uh, mm -hmm. colonization. These are individuals that stood for those Muhammadan morals, sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa ala, and they didn't use any excuse 
to replace the morality and the way of the Prophet ﷺ, with, as you mentioned, a bloodlust. But I want to talk to you, I mean, about mm -hmm. the cultural impact now in the United States and in Canada of what's happening uh, in Gaza. We're seeing so many people convert. We're seeing so many actually Jewish voices for peace mm -hmm. coming mm -hmm. out and standing up for the Palestinian people. And I think this is driving the Zionists crazy. You know, their narrative that they wanted pushed out for the past 75 years is now shattering in front of their own eyes, which is causing them to go even wilder in their response. What are your thoughts and what are you seeing, Coach Fraz? I think I think we have to mirror what the the Jews who are saying, not in my name, the Jewish groups who are saying, not in my name, Jews for peace, etc. The Muslims have to mirror this as well. Jews Jews and Muslims can come together because here's here's what uh, what people have to understand out there, okay? Judaism is about morality. Islam is about justice. Justice and morality. We're supposed to be the most law-abiding people on the face of the earth. We're supposed to be the most God-fearing, with Christians alone, okay? But right now, the situation is between Muslims and Jews. It should be unfathomable for a Muslim to murder somebody. It should be unfathomable for a Jewish person to murder somebody. It's, the, it's part of the Ten Commandments. You know, in the Ten Commandments, it doesn't say, that I shall conquer Israel and hold the land and, and and hold this territory. It's not one of the Ten Commandments. It wasn't was so crucial. It says, Thou shall not murder, thou shall not lie, thou shall not steal, etc. These are the most paramount rules. We can't go and chase something in dunya and break these rules. Okay, these are the rules we have to live by. We're supposed to teach the world these rules. <clears throat> and the Muslims should mirror along and say, Look, what Hamas did, the killing of innocent civilians is unacceptable. I think that should be voiced more often without hesitation. Because I also tell you this, I don't think Hamas did Palestinians any favors. I don't think the whole Arab world is doing Palestine any favors. Let me just say one thing. I know we're gonna we're gonna switch subjects shortly because I know it's I'm kind of going on a tangent here. But the Prophet, السلام, he was also persecuted and he did hijrah. He he migrated, he left the territories. And it was mandatory for the Muslims to leave, mandatory. And it was painful. They had to leave their belongings. They had to leave some of their loved ones, etc. They had to migrate. He didn't say, look, let's burrow down here, fight to the death, uh, uh, sabotage them in the middle of the night. He, this is, was not our, uh, this is not the sunnah of Islam. And he had to leave Mecca. Mecca is the most holy city. Not the third most holy city. I know a lot of Muslims out there, they want to be, and I'm not saying, I'm not saying that the correct strategy is the Palestinians leaving. I'm not saying that. All I'm saying is they're bearing the brunt, the, the innocent women and children, the innocent Muslims, the innocent women and children are bearing the brunt of our staunch attitude to want to fight head to head and want to get revenge. And we're putting our children, we're putting our women and children, we're putting innocent young men at risk. Instead of being more intelligent, you know, I, my whole world is fighting. Okay, There are smart ways to fight. But people generally fight with anger, bloodlust. They're vicious. Israel is fighting right now with bloodlust, and the Arabs also now are fighting or resisting with bloodlust. There are smarter, more intelligent ways because the Sunnah is to value the Muslim life more than the territory. There's no earth. Now, I understand there's a time and place to do fight to the death. There is a time and place. But there are smarter ways. The Prophet Ali Salam was highly intelligent, highly strategic. And it was a blessing for us to leave because now we have Medina. The, the Muslims left and founded Medina, the second most holy city. There is a wisdom in, a, in, in the Muslims doing hijrah. Our whole calendar is based around this event. And that's the sunnah. I'm not saying that this is the exact same scenario exactly. I'm not wise enough. I'm not, I'm not privy enough to the exact situation. But I find also the Muslim world the Muslim leaders around the world should be more ready and willing to rescue at least the women and children, at least the younger lives. And I understand the need to hold territory, etc. But the young lives that are being the, being lost, to me, is uh, unacceptable. And the Muslim world, the Arab world, is next door. And those lives are incredibly precious. Yeah, uh, Coach Raz, you're opening up a, a conversation that if we got into it fully, yeah, I think it would take all of our time. So I think let, yeah. let's move to somewhere else. Yes, yes. You know, I think for our listeners, you know, they're listening to you and 
they know you as an MMA coach. Uh, they know you as the uh, you know the trainer of GSP. You know, <laughs> arguably one of the uh, the greatest uh, mixed martial artists uh, ever ever to fight. And even you know when I when I open up your uh, Wikipedia page, actually, this is kind of funny, uh, Sajad. If you can open it up, you scroll down, coaching career, personal life, controversy. Controversy <laughs> has been criticized. Oh boy. Fact that he refuses to train with women in BJJ. To me, that's a great thing. So, you know, for many of us, we're looking and say, "Mashallah!" You know, Coach Faraz has his faith on straight. <laughs> May Allah bless you, Coach yeah, Faraz. You. What's your story of faith? You know, share it uh, with us. My story of faith. Well, you know, I I'm, I'm born in a Muslim family, but not a very religious family. You know, my parents immigrated here from Lebanon. They were, you know, busy putting food on the table. Um, you know, we were taught a little bit about Islam, but not very profoundly, okay, not very in depth. When I started, when I went to university, I started study. When I went to college and university, I started study study philosophy, and I started to study logic. And I loved all ideas, you know. So for me, I was I was really obsessed with truth. I wanted to find what is this thing called truth. Now, I wasn't doing it for monetary reasons. I was just doing it for my own personal journey. But I was extremely obsessed with it. I would never talk about it publicly. I would never really engage in, in conversation with people who are not in the know. But over time, uh, as you know, I got more popular, people asked me questions, I started answering, and people started realizing, oh, I have, I have a, philosophy, a philosophy background. And for me, philosophy, guys, it just means logic. Okay, So some, some Muslims, when they hear philosophy, they think Aristotle. Hmm. I'm not talking about Aristotle right now, even though I'm very familiar with the Greek philosophers. I'm talking about logic. I started to study logic formally and i find there's an absurdity in the muslim world where they think logic is haram that's an absurdity it is not haram i can tell you that this is a pure that's it's, it's pure innovation to say that okay it's, it's antithetic to the quran it makes no sense uh to to say that logic is haram is to use logic to say that logic is haram it's a self-defeating position it's irrational no muslim should ever say this it has to do with a misunderstanding i'm not going to cover it now i've covered it in the past maybe we'll cover it in the future it has to do with a misunderstanding of Ghazali's work, and it's completely absurd that Muslim today think that logic, studying formal logic is haram. If you're going to make logic haram, make mathematics haram, make engineering haram, it's all the same thing. It's all the same thing. It's all logic. With just, that said, I, no, no, sorry, no, no, no. I just to add, you know, Sidi Abu Hamid al-Ghazali, a book that he wrote was his uh, response to the philosophers, mm -hmm. the incoherence mm -hmm. of the philosophers, not of right. philosophy. Right. He was he When he was referring to the group that using as the philosophers, he was referring to the blind followers of Aristotle. Exactly, right? yeah. The people who just say, if Aristotle said it, it must be true. Yeah. And he was criticizing that. No, he says we need demonstration. What we would say is proof. We need proof that it's true, not just because Aristotle said it. We have to verify. And he was saying the philosophers are, you know, going in the haram. They did, they said 27 things that are haram, three of them are kufr. And that, that's where it all started. But he wasn't saying philosophy is haram. Philosophy, right. he was using logic. He was, he's formally trained in logic. He was teaching us logic. As a matter of fact, he says the complete opposite, but Muslims are not familiar with Ghazali. They never really read his works. I'm f quite familiar with his works. I can tell you that he was a logician of the highest of the highest uh, level. Yeah, we're going to get into him today, but I didn't mean to cut you off, but back to your story. Of yeah, back to what I was saying. So I was studying logic, 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 and I would study every idea. So I went across every major religion, and I would study their ideas, I would examine them, analyze them. And when I started to study the works of Ghazali, I really it really chimed with me because he was looking for what I was looking for, certainty, which is certainty. That's why I really connected with the works of Descartes, who's, who's in my opinion, the European Ghazali, and Ghazali, the Middle Eastern Ghazali. And I studied, I specialized in Greek philosophy, Muslim philosophy, and uh, British empiricism, so European philosophy, the Enlightenment period. Okay, That's the three major philosophical periods I studied. And I still study to this day. I've been studying for over 20 years. I can tell you that after studying the works of Ghazali ibn Tufayl, I start to understand what's really meant, what Islam really means. And Islam is about certainty. It is about certainty between me and God, to have certainty of God. Now, not everybody's going to reach this level. Most people are going to have faith and belief. But Ghazali wanted certainty. And does Islam allow us to have certainty? And he he describes it as a yes. He, at the end, he, he has certainty. And I believe that this is probably this is the ultimate goal for every Muslim. Not every Muslim is going to reach there, and it's not necessary that you reach there. You can have salvation without it, but it's the best and most noble of all goals to have certainty. And that was Ghazali's life mission. Then I really started to become much more religious. Then I really started to get uh, um, and 
deeper, much deeper into the faith. Um, I felt that before I before I read Ghazali, I couldn't really understand the Quran. I believe that there are levels of understanding the Quran. Everybody can understand the Quran, but there are levels to understanding, and ultimately only Allah understands the true meaning of the Quran. That's explicit in the Quran, but there are levels to understanding the Quran. And the Muslims of the past understood it better than we'll ever uh, ever understand it, yes. Ghazali understood it better than we understand it now. And I feel that because of the internet, because of now dialogues, we're having public public dialogues, there's a resurgence of Muslim logic. Because Muslim logic was at the forefront of the world. The golden age, people don't know this, but the golden age of science and rational thinking was with the Muslims. Neil deGrasse Tyson said it publicly, and he got lambasted for it, but he said there was no more innovation before or after. It was the time with the most innovations. He goes, there's a reason why the algorithms and Arabic world word there's a reason why we call it Arabic numerals the Arabic numerals the numeral system you ha you have today hails from India it's, but it was popularized by the Arab world the Arabs mastered the Arabic numerals even though the Indians were great mathematicians themselves the Arabs went to another level with mathematics algebra algebra is an Arabic word he said Neil deGrasse Tyson says why do you think three quarters of the stars in the sky have Arabic names where do you think that came from the Arabs were great scientists and astrologers the scientific method itself was 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 devised by Ibn al-Haytham. Even though they tried to, they tried to give credit, they tried to accredit it to the Bacon brothers, Francis and Roger Bacon. The Francis Bacon, he refers to Al-Ghazali. Roger Bacon refers to Al-Ghazali six hundred years before. There's so much that the Muslims don't know about their own history. It's it's quite uh, alarming. However. I see a resurgence because the young Muslims now, they're interacting with other faiths and it's stimulating now their, their desire for answers. And when they're going to study Islamic philosophy and logic, they're going to find you know, it was, it's in, in, incredibly well developed. Now, with that said, ultimately speaking, I don't believe we, all, I don't believe we get to Allah by logic. We can, logic can point to Allah, but it cannot encompass Allah. I think I believe in the fitrah. This is what really brought me to Islam. Really, but it made me feel now that I, I I'll never have a doubt. Like you could bring me any argument, you could bring me any new findings. I will never have a doubt that Allah exists because I discovered the fitrah. And ultimately speaking, Islam is about discovering your fitrah. The Quran says it beautifully. It says, "Tell the people of the book, the Jews, the Christians, that Abraham was upon was a righteous man. He was upon the path." Because the Bible is about the story of Abraham. If the Bible is about the story of Abraham, then Abraham didn't have the Bible, right? He's, he's, it's, the Bible is telling you his story. He was a righteous man. He was upon the fitrah. He was there before the text. So one religion says this, one religion says that, one guy thinks this, one philosopher thinks that. All these rational thinkers, they all disagree with one another. Plato and Aristotle completely disagreed. Plato was the master of Aristotle. He schooled him for 20 years. Then Aristotle realized, hey, I completely disagree with you. I have a completely different opinion than you. All the great, fast forward to our age today, modern science, Sch Schrodinger disagreed with Heisenberg fundamentally on the reality of existence, of what an atom is. Like every age, the great thinkers disagreed. Logic points to Allah, but the belief in God is ultimately psychology. Because I'll tell you something very important that I've realized over the years, that there is no such thing as an atheist. Hmm. Everybody's born upon the fitrah, this natural theology, this innate belief in Allah, in God. You're born knowing about God. And then things in the dunya, things in the world compete for, for the attention. There's God and then there's everything else is competing for your attention. When you were in your mother's womb, you didn't know even about your, your own existence. You didn't even know about your ego. You know, in psychology, they say it takes about one year after the child is born to start developing that there's me and the other, other there's me and the world to have this dichotomy of there's me, I have an ego, there's I, and then there's the rest of the world. It takes, oh, it takes less than a year, but it's around that point where the child now starts to realize that there's a world out there and there's me and I'm the center of this world. From my, I have a point of view and I'm my point of view is unique. There are others and then there's me. I have an ego now. I'm starting to develop an ego. Before you had an ego, you already existed. You are upon the fitrah. You didn't know about, you didn't know about money. You didn't know about your name. You didn't know about your parents. You didn't know about it. But you were incubated. You were incubated. That's why the, the, the Quran teaches us that everybody's born Muslim. The Sunnah teaches us everybody is born upon this faith, this Islamic faith. That's why we say Adam was a Muslim. 
alayhi salam. Every human being was born Muslim. And then their parents, the Prophet alayhi salam tells us, they make them so-and-so, Christian, Buddhist, atheist, whatnot. It's, that's psychology. Islam is about, Islam is, is cooperated. The Quran is the reminder. What is it reminding us of? This innate knowledge you have. The you know, Quran tells us, go back to your innate religion. The Quran is reminding us of something we know. Because the thing is, in logic, we have something called circular reasoning. If I say, look, I believe in the Bible. Why do you believe in the Bible? The Bible is true because the Bible says it's true. Well, that's circular reasoning. You need something that corroborates the Bible. The Quran is telling you, look, you're born upon the fitrah. That corroborates what I'm telling you now. Now, look at the, the beautiful subtleties in the Quran. The beautiful subtleties. The Quran tells Prophet Muhammad, salam, tells him, you didn't know the story of Noah. We informed you. You, didn't, you were not a witness to the story of Adam. You were not a witness to how we made man. There's a lot of controversy of how Adam came to be. But these are things, I don't have to figure them out for salvation. I don't have to figure them out to know Allah. I don't have to. Because here's the thing. Everything is belief except Allah. Allah is, you, could, you know Allah exists. The people who don't believe in God, they're disbelievers. It's psychology. And I'll, I'll, I'll prove it to you from the Quran even. Mm. <clears throat> the shaitan is called a disbeliever in the Quran. But he, he has a dialogue with Allah in the Quran. How could he disbelieve in Allah? Disbeliever doesn't mean you don't believe in Allah's existence. Disbeliever is you don't believe you, you submit to Allah is, the, is, the, is a path to salvation. When you don't submit to Allah, now you're a disbeliever. Because I believe that submitting to Allah is the ultimate 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 meaning of existence this is explicit in the quran if you disbelieve in this khala, something else took your attention your ego money women uh, cars something else you, know, you you live for something else the muslim he lives only for allah and he has no doubt in, allah, in allah's existence you cannot be wrong about something you know innately. You can know you could be wrong about something you know logically. You could be wrong about something you know scientifically. And I could prove this to you in a thousand and one ways. Anybody want to challenge me on this? This is very easy to demonstrate. But I cannot be wrong about something I know intuitively. You cannot take that away from me. Now, some people are going to claim they know things intuitively and they don't. There are only a few things we know intuitively. Like for instance, we know existence. There is existence. Can you deny existence exists? Well, if you try to deny it, you're kind of proving it because how could you deny if you don't exist? Some things are known intuitively. They're not beliefs anymore. They're knowledge. You cannot be wrong about it. The human being, when he was in the womb of his mother, he knew about existence. He knew about a oneness. He didn't know about two or three or all these other inventions that he learned in the dunya. These are all subjective terms. There's only one objectivity in, the, in the, all of existence. Uh, we can get into this deeper later on, but this is a very profound topic. And this is what Ghazali, I feel, expressed and discovered discovered and expressed in a very complicated way. He, he's not he's not the easiest read. He's a very difficult read. But if you're a master of reading you, and you're a master of logic, you can decipher Ghazali. Because ultimately, he takes us to this point in the Mishkat, in his book, uh, The Niche of Lights, which uh, is basically named after a verse in the Quran. The ultimate goal of the Muslim is to attains the certainty he once had. And I find it to be a beautiful thing. I find that nothing else compares. And anybody who falls short of this um, is not attained, in my opinion, the most important human endeavor. And you're talking about the concept of ma'rifa. Yes. Like, this is the ultimate. Like Then you understand, I, I think, at a much deeper level what the Quran is saying. Because if you read the Quran... In this context, read the Quran. Say, when you read the Quran tonight, read it in the context that everybody believes in Allah. You know, in the, in the Quran, there's a verse where Allah he, he asks all of mankind, "Who is your Lord?" And we all give the shahada. We all say, "You're you're the one God." We all give the kalama. We all say, "You're the one God." And then we're sent into existence. So the Quran is telling you that it's telling you, look, you have you have an innate idea of me. You know who I am. I did, you don't have to be a brilliant logician. You don't have to have the highest IQ. We have men of high IQ who both believe in God and don't believe in God. Is it a question of IQ? It's not a question of IQ. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Is It's a question of psychology. Is there something more important to you than God? If there is, you're a disbeliever. If there's nothing more important to you than Allah, and you worship God, He's the most important thing in your life, then you're a believer. 
Of course, be believer means other things too. You believe in the message. You believe in you know. Of course, there are, there are other there are other types of shirk. Okay, but first and foremost, you believe in tawhid, the one and true God, and this is an experience. It's a direct experience. It's not something you know cognitively, logically. It's not something I, I, I cannot imagine. A, the, the world's most intelligent man was born blind. Okay, no matter how logical, intelligent he is, I cannot make him understand what the word red means. He can never know the color red. He has to have eyes and has to see red, and then he'll know red. It doesn't. Trust me, I, 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 all philosophers agree on this. You cannot cognitively know the color red. You can only have an experience of red, and then we can refer to red, the color red. I'm referring to the color red here. Okay, everything is known by experiences. Everything you have in your mind was once through the senses. This is very well agreed upon in philosophy. Okay, everything you have in your mind was once in your senses. Think about Santa Claus. Santa Claus, we all, nobody agrees, nobody believes in Santa Claus, but everything that makes up Santa Claus exists. The color red exists, men exist, flying exists, reindeer exists, sleighs exist, a sled exists. You saw a bird flying the sky, now you have the idea of bird, uh, a flight. Now you jumbled up all those ideas in your head. You made up a idea. But everything that makes up that idea must exist. So if you dream up the marshmallow man, you know, you watch the Ghostbusters. There's a marshmallow man at the end. Oh, yeah. Mashallah. You saw a marshmallow. You saw a man. You saw augmentation. Okay, I'll invent a marshmallow man. The human beings carry in their consciousness the idea of the divine. If I tell you, if I tell you, look, I believe in the divine. You already know what I'm talking about, but I've never pointed in the dunya and said, look, this is divine. Look, hold this in your hand. Like I showed you the color red, like I showed you up and down, like I showed you hot and cold, like I showed you sweet and salty. I never showed you here. Here's the vine. Here it is. You never saw it in the dunya. Where is it then? You were born with the idea. In pre-existence, we saw the divine. We experienced the divine. And inshallah, in the highest level of Jannah, we experience the divine again. This is the, the highest reward in paradise is to look upon God, to see God again. Okay, to see God, to know God directly. So what I'm telling you is we have an innate sense. Now, some people object. Some people say, you know, I'll give you some of the famous arguments against, okay? They say, look, if you know imperfection, then you know perfection. If you know something that's not divine, then you know the divine. Well, the Quran actually answers this, but I'm going to put it in a, uh, in a way that's a m more modern way, okay? If the whole world was darkness, you know, the Quran asks you, if the whole world asks you to think about this, if the whole world was dark, who would bring you a light? Who would bring you light? Imagine we lived in darkness. Would you, with your genius and your logic and your and your fancy scientific method, would you dream up, hey, you know, I'm dreaming up light clusters. There might be this thing called light. No, you would never know anything about light. You would never dream of light because the light never went through your senses. Now, the first guy to turn on a light bulb or lightning strikes and a bush starts to burn and we see light for the first time now we have an experience of light now when we're in our in, in the dark we think hey remember that the light thing our memories are jogged we have to have experience of light to know light if the whole world is in perfection you would never know the, the divine you have to have experience of the divine and then when you came in this world you saw things are nothing here is divine nothing that's why the prophet salam ibrahim in jest he says oh the stars are my god <clears throat> then the moon, the moon has a greater light. Then the sun. Now, of course, he was doing this in jest. Okay, why is he doing this in jest? Because the people at the time, they believed that the stars were a lesser god to the moon, and the moon was a lesser god to the sun, etc. And then he says, "No, none of these are my god. I'm projecting my belief of the divine onto these, the the dunya." He realized that no, I cannot mix the divine with anything in the dunya. Like some people believe in the God of war, the God of love, the God of the crocodile God. Well, they took their innate belief and they mixed it with something in the dunya. The Quran is telling you, look, don't associate anything with this divine. You are born with it. You know about the divine. It's it's undeniable. Because when I talk to a blind man about the color red, you know what he tells me? He's like, I don't know what you're talking about. I've heard about this thing, but I have no reference point. But when I talk to an atheist about God, he never tells me, well, I have no reference point. I don't even, I can't even fathom. I can't even imagine. You know, sometimes I, when I talk to an atheist, I tell him, hey, can you imagine a copay? He's like, what, what, what do you mean? What's I said, I just made up that word. I took two syllables. It doesn't refer to anything in the dunya. And he's like, oh, well, I couldn't, I couldn't even, yeah, you couldn't even, I told you, like, I, I completely confused you. But when I talk about the divine, you tell me, yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about, divine. Yeah, I know exactly. 
I know what divine means. Yeah, it would be a perfect being on all, you know, a, a, a God, God. I would know it's God, a perfect being. Yet we never say, we never talk to an atheist and they say, oh, I don't even know what you mean about it. I can't. But when I give them a decoy word, they give me that reaction. I don't know what you're talking about. Look, you're going to have to define it. I don't understand. But I tell them, no, you know, man. You know the definition. Because here's the thing. We cannot perfectly define God. God is known via experience. I cannot perfectly define the color red. You have to. That's why Ghazali says it's by dope, taste. How the Muslim knows is by taste. The Quran is telling you, you gave shahada to Allah. When you read the Quran tonight, read in this context. The reason they say, why they say they don't believe in God, it's psychology. It's not logic. They'll give you 101 logical answers, logical reasons, this and that, which we can go back and forth. Of course, I'm happy to argue against every one of them because there is a there is a way to God via logic, but you only get it only points to God. It doesn't it doesn't give you a taste. It doesn't give you a direct experience. Now, sadly, Muslims have moved away from this type of thinking. Okay, because it's too sophisticated for them and they went through a dark period after the Mongol invasion, the Muslims went through a dark period. And I think it's high time now we uh, come out of that. Well, I think a lot of that came from the Sadafism and Wahhabism also of late, which tried to kill these sort of ideas. And these well, I don't want to get into uh, that discussion right now, but okay, we won't. That, that would be a whole other topic. You yeah, know? Okay, we'll it, would email, it would have to have a, you know, a, a few subject matter experts maybe on the panel, but I don't want to get into that discussion. Okay. But, you know, they, they try to, you know, you know, there's so many, there's so many things to, Talk about. I know people are going to find a little information here and there. They're going to make a. At the end of the day, Islam. We believe we're born with the idea of God. Here's in contrast with Christianity. Christianity is telling us, look, Jesus died for you two thousand years ago. That event happened. If you don't believe that historical event happened, you're lost. Hmm. Paul is very explicit. Paul, who wrote the Bible, the original text of the Bible, the New Testament, he says. If Christ didn't die, it wasn't resurrected. If he wasn't crucified, died and resurrected, your faith is in vain. All this prayer, all your beliefs, the Bible, everything I'm writing now is worthless. So they're constantly trying to prove a historical event where the Quran is telling you the opposite. Now, I'll tell you something. Look, I didn't witness the story of Noah, but I believe in the story of Noah. I believe the story of Noah is historical. But also, I can confirm something about the story of Noah. I can confirm to you that if the whole world seems like it's going to end, and Allah is with you, he'll find you a salvation. You'll find the path to salvation. This is something I can confirm to you right now. Now, that I see, you know, the Quran doesn't say the whole world was flooded. It says the sinners were drowned. So it's it's, it's very different. You know, sometimes we, we we superimpose what we read in the Bible on the Quran, but the Quran actually never explicitly says the entire world was. That's another topic for another day, okay? But I'm telling you, look, the Quran is telling you, look, there's a moral truth here. There's a lesson to be learned. Take that. You weren't there for the story of Noah. You would have never heard about it. It's not It's not something for you to try, go and empirically prove. The Quran tells us when they say about the crucifixion of Christ, tell them everybody who says something, they're just it's just guesswork. And I totally agree. I've done a heavy amount of research on the crucifixion of Christ. I'm telling you, a very heavy amount of research. And I can tell you, they have no idea. Historians say it's a given. Why? Because people don't understand what a historical fact is. A historical fact is nothing compared to a scientific fact. They're not one and the same. Historical facts are not reproducible. And mathematical facts or logical facts are far superior. The inductive, inductive facts don't hold a candle to deductive facts. And deductive facts are, don't hold a candle to intuitive facts, direct experience. You can't be wrong about that existence exists. You can't be wrong about things like this. It doesn't matter how naive you are or how illogical you are. It's a given. It's known directly. So people have to understand there's a hierarchy of facts. Quran is telling you, look, take the most certain type of fact, uh, intuitive fact. The Christian text is telling us, look, take this historical fact. It has to have happened. But the historical facts are highly dubious. How could I put my theology on something that the most, the most, the most unlikely fact, the most easy to debunk facts, the most uncertain facts are historical facts. I'll put that in quotes because we're doing we're equivocating here. We're falsely equivocating the words. When I say intuitive fact, deductive fact, inductive fact, abductive fact, or historical fact, you're using your logic to try to figure out what happened in the past. You're trying to be uh, uh, what do they call him? The famous uh, Sherlock Holmes. Dude, we cannot even figure out what happened to JFK. The CIA, the FBI, the world's smartest people, modern technology. It's on video camera. 
Are you people listening to me? It's on video camera. We had surveillance. We had all his, we had every test. I, I don't want to get into JFK, but it's it's such a complex historical event. They looked at it from every angle and still they're not sure how this man was shot. They're still not sure how many shooters, how many bullets were fired. That's modern day events. Now, go to 2,000 years ago. We're talking about an event I'll tell you why historians say it's a given because the word, the name Jesus, alayhi salam, okay, is like the name Joe. Now, Jesus is a Latinized version of the original name, which either was Isa or, or, or Isu or Yeshua. There's a debate about that. I don't want to get into the semantics about the name. That's, some, that's a debate for another day. The Jews, they don't have a J. So there's no G. Exists. There's Ye or E. That's a very common name. It's like Joe. There was a lot of name, men named Joe, Jesus, who were crucified by Romans. It's a given that that happened. Some say hundreds of thousands. Some say tens of thousands. The historical records are not, they're estimates, okay? They're guesstimates. They don't know how many people, there was no registry, you know, the, anyways, I don't, I don't want to get into the registry, but we don't know how many people, how, how long exactly they lived. We don't know the population sizes. We have estimates. We have guesstimates. History is highly, highly dubious. The Quran is fully aware of that. And it's telling you, look, everybody who says this happened on the day of the crucifixion, they're guessing. They're full of doubt. We're not going to base our theology on what happened on a particular day, on an event that happened 2,000 years ago, which believe you me, anybody who says they proved it, it's, 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 it's an absurdity. Okay, Philosophers, we don't, we don't take that word lightly. Proof is a very powerful word in philosophy. Okay. We laugh at this. Somebody tells me he proved something historically. I laugh at this. Like I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to demean anybody's religion. No, no, no. I'm just saying, in terms of the word proof, it's not proof. Okay, it's not. It's far from proof. And I respect everybody's religion, everybody's sacred text, of course. And I want to show the utmost respect. My comments here are referring to historians. When they say proof, they don't mean the same thing. When <laughs> logicians say proof, we have a much higher standard. The Quranic standard for Proof is much higher. It's not, it's telling you deliberately. Don't be, don't copy these this group here who's trying to go prove these historical events. Yes, take them as true. Ghazali tells us, look, everything in the Quran is literal till it makes doesn't make sense, it's literal. Then we say it's a metaphor. Okay, so that's a topic for another day. I'm not gonna get into that because it's actually quite complex. But I'm one of the Muslims who believes there is metaphor in the Quran. There is metaphor. They can't can't. There's no doubt in my mind there's metaphor. The Quran says those who are blind in this world will be blind in the next. Are you telling me that people who are literally blind in this world, they won't have vision in the next world? Like some Muslims tell me, yeah, 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 no, everything is literal. There cannot be any metaphor. And there's reasons for that. It's a podcast for another day. It's a highly debated topic. But there, there has to be, in my opinion, there has to be metaphor. And that's fine because metaphor, metaphorical truths are also very powerful. And they are true. So... Islam is very, very, very powerful in this sense. Once you understand what the Quran is saying in this sense, it gives you a great security that God exists, there is an afterlife, and we're held liable for what we do. So once I attained this, I started to realize that, wow, like, I started to realize that what Islam is trying to tell me about my natural religion that I'm certain of I have concrete proof of. That's why I tell people, I don't believe in God. I know God exists. Now, I don't want to sound arrogant, but everybody knows God exists. The reason the reason people don't say that, it's psychology, and there's a barrier between man and God, and the barrier is... The barrier is a veil. It's a veil. It's, a, it's, it's the dunya. It's everything that competes with, that competes with Allah. This is a veil between you and Allah. Allah doesn't hide from you. The Quran says, when they ask you, where am I? I am near. You know, the Quran says, Allah is closer to us than our juggler, juggler vein. This is how they would, you know, when you butcher an animal. That's that's your life. That's the Lord. That's, Allah is closer to you than your life. There's nothing closer to you than Allah. But you're creating a distance between you and Allah. You're creating a distance by being romanced by all these other things in the dunya and the world. Including your ego, your selfishness, your desires, etc. So, so, coach, you, you you have this this moment in this. Now you're in college at this point. Um, I would say after university, I start to really 
have these uh, understandings. And at the same time, uh, I believe from what I've read around the age 18, you're getting into your MMA trading. Uh, I started trading quite late, actually, around 1920. Okay. But I was very intense in training. I, I really gave my whole eight hours a day into trading. Okay, so this is both happening at the same time. Yeah, so I would listen. I I listen to a lot of audiobooks. I have hundreds and hundreds. I probably have like a thousand audiobooks. I've I re, I read ferociously, but when I say read, I mean I listen. Um. I train, let's say twice a day. I spend about six hours a day in the gym. I do a lot of studying. I do a tremendous amount of studying and reading. And I commute two hours a day. So my commute is all studying audiobooks. So I have at least minimum, I would say six hours a day of audiobooks. Like I'm a, I'm a, I'm a bit extreme in that sense. Okay. I'm, I'm, a, I'm, uh, I love like how people watch TV. I listen to books, you know, so I have an, I have a, it's a great joy for me. It's not hard for me. So I have a tremendous amount of experience with books, you know, classics, et cetera. So in this case, you know, in the case, let's, let's just compare in the case of Sidi Abu Hamd al-Ghazali, when he was having these realizations, he decided, you know what, I need to divorce myself of all of my connections, as he writes in the Munqid al-Dalal. And it took him a while. He says, I took one step forward, three steps back. And then finally, I made the decision, I'm throwing myself all in. I'm going all in into this concept of ma'rifah. I'm going purely into just the state of complete ibadah of Allah Azza wa Jal. So... Allah can give me some of these experiences to even know him in a fuller way. Did you have this experience where you're like, uh, this world, I don't want to... Uh, I don't like to comment on this. You know, this is, this is okay. too personal. Personally, I, I, I want to go into this. And, uh, you know, even Ghazali warns, you shouldn't write about this stuff. You know, this, because there is, look, I'll tell you something. There is a type of madness that comes with... Sometimes I read writings from Muslims and I understand that they're going through a madness. Because yeah. the thing is, you know, the way they explain it is the Prophet had a higher ceiling than, than us. He can understand more about God without going mad. Okay, there is a type of madness when you start to contemplate God, you become slightly mad because the idea of God is too profound for any human being to carry. Now, the Prophet Ali Salam was a very special human being. He can he could withstand more, but you know, like the, like the Quran says, you know, if if the Quran, if we sent this on the mountain, you would see the mountain humbled and crumbled. The message is so heavy. It's so powerful. You know, a mountain, you can't move a mountain. But if you understood what the Quran was saying, if that mountain understood what the Quran is saying, it would be crumbled, it would be eviscerated. So when a man starts to understand the Quran, he can go, and this is a sensitive topic, we shouldn't get into it too much, yeah, but no. it's, 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 humans cannot, Allah is too great for the human mind. Yeah, you know, I've been around a lot of Mashaikh, uh, Coach Faraz, and you have the, the what I call the sober Sufi. The one who has, you know who has these experiences and he's able to still maintain normal humanistic ties and operate in the world. Then you have the one who's like the Majidub, who yeah. has these experiences yeah. and you know he's partially there, not really. <laughs> exactly. So they they can you could fall into a type of madness and now yeah. you know that it's such a complex topic, but it's a okay. sensitive topic. You know, yeah, so. we'll leave it to another time. Yeah. So so tell me at this point then you know just because I have so. Depending on your time, there's so many things I'd like to discuss. With Go you. ahead, take your time. Okay, so you start to get into MMA. Mm -hmm. You know, how did that happen for you? And it, talk to our our listeners and our viewers about that. I saw Hoyce Gracie in oh, UFC. Part of our conversation. <laughs> another another important topic. <laughs> yeah, I have that listed here. But go ahead. We'll, we'll oh, get sorry, it. I thought you were playing a clip. Well, actually, uh, let's play that clip. Actually, yeah, play play the clip. Inshallah, play. Everyone who Hoyce Gracie is. This is my hero, guys. This is my hero. This is the man. <laughs> okay, let's play this. You do believe there's only one God? Yes. Right? You have no problem testifying to that? Yes. And you believe that Abraham, Moses, Jesus, Muhammad were all messengers of God? Yes. You don't worship any of them, right? No. Okay. We're going to do the testimony. I'm going to do it with you, all right? Ashadu al la ilaha illallah wa ashadu ana Muhammad abduhu wa rasul. Allahu Akbar. It's amazing. Allah Akbar. Allah Akbar. Right, we're going to say it in English, all right? I bear witness. There is none worthy of worship. There is none worthy of worship. Except one Allah. Except one Allah. And I bear witness. And I bear witness. That Muhammad. That Muhammad. Is a messenger of Allah. It's a message of Allah. Allahu Akbar. Muslim. Allah Akbar. That's it. We're going to Mecca. <laughs> Your hero. I saw this clip. Coach. <laughs> Mashallah. Honestly, I'm really happy you took that step. Um, when I saw him for the first time, I, I couldn't believe martial arts works. You know, he was a little guy. In the, he was the smallest guy in the tournament. I know, I know fighting is haram, of course. So I don't want to glorify it too much here. 
but it gave me a sense of hope because I was smaller when I was growing up. I was bullied a lot. I couldn't believe that the smallest guy was able to withstand all these bigger, muscular, uh, ferociously scary human beings. I mean, I was looking at these guys. I'm like, oh, my goodness. I can't believe that this little guy won. Now, I was very skeptical because I thought maybe he got lucky. I don't know what it was. When I watched the second one, I watched it live, the second UFC event because the first event had already happened. I didn't know anything about it. And I saw the commercial to the second event, which was a pay-per-view. I begged my parents to get it. My brothers, we begged, we begged. They got it for us. We got the pay-per-view. We watched him win a second time and I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. I was hooked. And not because I wanted to become a fighting champion, because I wanted to be able to defend myself. I was getting bullied. I was getting harassed, etc. You know, I was a smaller individual. And I started to read every magazine and every Hoist Gracie interview and every little, you know, in the magazine, they would show you moves and I would practice them. And I was like, there was no jiu-jitsu available. Then I met somebody who was a purple belt training under Henzo Gracie. He was so happened to be teaching. I went to a jiu-jitsu tournament. I saw a pro poster for jiu-jitsu tournaments. It was very new. I, I didn't know what jiu-jitsu tournaments exist. I went there. I saw this coach who was a, a trainer. I asked to go and train with them. I went to visit and he was a purple belt from Henzo Gracie. He was training in New York on the weekends. He would drive from Montreal to New York. Henzo Gracie, one of the cousins of Hoyce, who we just saw on, on, on the screen. And I started to train with him. And I was just about to turn 20. So about 20 years old, I started training. But I was hooked. Like I was going to Thailand every summer to train kickboxing, Muay Thai. That you know, I was training every day, literally every day, two times a day. I was really completely immersed in martial arts. And at that time, I had a, a strong desire for logic. Also, I was studying logic. I was reading the classics. So I was very highly immersed in these two things that I had a passion for, um, not knowing that in my later on in my life I'd be using both. Not knowing. I was just following my passion. And it was easy for me to spend hours learning jiu-jitsu, and it was easy for me to sit down and think about these logical arguments. It was very intriguing, and it was something that was natural for me. And I just followed that passion, and that passion today has evolved into a, a career. Which, which, you know, of, you know, that passion you connected with, of course, a very famous uh, jujitsu teacher, John Danaher. Yes. Took your black belt <laughs> under him. Yes. So, you know, what's fascinating, because I want you to talk about that process, because for me, coach, look, <clears throat> there's a connection between the spiritual and the physical. Mm -hmm. I mean, the properties of discipline are the same. You know, in the spiritual, we eat less. We, we try to talk less. You know, you do more vicar. You try to remove these, you know. Uh, bad elements uh, from the heart that are overwhelming greed jealousy this and that so there's you have to resist and you have to exercise you have to do in the physical realm it's the same thing mm -hmm. you have to resist you know i want to eat mm -hmm. that donut i really want to mm -hmm. eat that donut i'm not going to eat that donut i need to make weight mm -hmm. and you have to put in a lot of effort and so you know i try to talk to everyone very often you know, I'll, I'll tell you something very scary and this actually really scared me i was giving a talk in a masjid in new jersey there's a lot of people there and so I wanted to give an example about, you know, well, let me give a spiritual example, but connected to the physical. And I asked everyone a question. I said, okay, how many of you men have gone on a diet? Coach, no one raised their hand. And really? I said, I said, no, no, don't be embarrassed. This is, I <laughs> need you to answer this question. Everybody. And no one raised their really? hand. And I said, oh my goodness, we well, got a problem here because going on a diet teaches you how to refrain. Mm-hmm. You know, it teaches you, I need to accomplish a goal. How do I get to that goal? So what fascinates me, and I want you to talk about here, you know, your realm of being a black belt, especially under someone who was so difficult probably to get a black belt from, is that it gives others experience of what you had to go through to be able to accomplish something in life. So if you could talk about that. Well, the thing is, even when you do something you love, if you do it so much, it could start to become irritating to do it. Like sometimes I don't want to go to jiu-jitsu practice, but I'm dedicated to excellence. I'm dedicated to it. I want to be the greatest martial artist possible. Mm. I'm dedicated to excellence. So I remind myself, hey, I'm dedicated to excellence. I will go today. But the thing is, I definitely get more than my fill of jiu-jitsu. I'm doing it every day, twice a day, wrestling every day, boxing. It's just so much martial arts that that's when it becomes tough. So I feel like if you want to be good at something, it's got to be fun. You got It's got to be something you like because if you don't like it, it's, let's say you don't want you don't like engineering, but you're forced into engineering. It's going to be hard to be creative and put in the extra hours because if you really want to be great at something, you have to go past the point of pleasure where it's it's not pleasing anymore. Doing more of it, it's not giving me more pleasure, but it, now it's work. It becomes 
um, ex exhaustive. So for instance, if you're going to go on a diet, yes, you have to design a diet that makes sense for you. So I, I go on diets all the time. I make a menu and I'm like, okay, this is good. But there's going to be a point where I'm sick of my diet and I got to stick to it and I got to be true to it. So even when you like something, it's not automatic necessarily that you're going to get to the highest level. You'll get to a higher level than if you're doing something you don't like. Yes. But we're talking about higher and higher and higher levels. If you want to go to these higher levels, I don't care how much you like a certain thing. It gets tough. Even religious discipline, spiritual discipline. There were times where, you know, I, you know, Ghazali went through torture, yeah. you know, thinking these things. A lot of these things, you know, you get, it, it, there's a lot of places in the human psyche that are scary. But if you push through, you know, if, if you push through, ultimately speaking, it's always worth it. If you get to the highest level, the, the highest level possible, everybody has a potential, everybody has a limitation. But you're self-actualizing. You're exhausting your potential to reach as far as you can. So, yeah, about that, Coach, you know, uh, in terms of even goal setting, you know, I, dealing with the Muslim community very often, again, I talk to them, I'm like, what are your goals? And people say, well, I don't know. I just sort of fell into my job. I fell mm -hmm. in, married a woman. We have kids now. And everyone's just in this sort of routine, not knowing what direction in life they're going. And Allah asks the question, where are you going? What are you doing? Mm -hmm. So can you can you talk about the importance in this concept of you know goal setting or having a direction to go towards? Well, here's the thing. I think I think Muslims should have the best engineers, the best architects, the best everything, wrestling coach, the best doctors, the best, from, from the most regular job to the most important job. Why? Because when we're not the best at something, we will get stepped on. Look what's happening with the Palestinians now. Because they're not because, look, they don't have money. They don't have power. They don't have powerful allies. People are crushing them. People are uh, abusing them. Why? They have the same. They should have the same human rights as everybody else. We're in the modern day period. We're in the most peaceful time in history, actually. But yet, they treat them like they're subhuman. The, 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 I forget which military uh, leader it was, but he said, we're dealing with human animals. They're not innocent civilians. The, pre the president is saying that they're not innocent. Even the child is not innocent. Even the 12-year-old, the they call him a terrorist. Uh, ben Gavir, like I said earlier in the podcast, he's calling a 12-year-old boy a terrorist. Like they can demean us so badly. You know why? Because we can do nothing about it. Why? Because the Ummah, the, the, the Muslims today, they forgot about how important it is to be excellent. The Muslims used to be excellent. Mm. They used to be the best at math, the best at science, the best at history, the best at arche archaeology, the best at... at astronomy the best at everything people went all over the world to travel to baghdad if you want to be educated now you go to oxford but before these to be baghdad baghdad was the original university people forget their history because we fell out of love with being excellent today a lot of our brothers and sisters are dying because we can't you know the truth of the matter is the arab world today they're a sleeping giant. They're not strong like they used to be they're intimidated by the west the west is more technologically advanced not that that's going to last Technology today is going leaps and bounds. Today, even yeah, even 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 the Houthis have drones. <laughs> Tomorrow, th this is another. I'm telling you, I know a lot about fighting. I think about fighting all the time. I'll tell you something. The Israeli strategy won't last forever. You know, they if I was them, I would try to make peace with my neighbors. I would try to make, I would try to coexist with them because even if even if Netanyahu goes to his grave, let's imagine he's successful. Let's imagine he crushes Hamas. He pushes the Palestinians out of his border. Let's say he's successful. So have a thought experiment. And he goes to his grave. Guess what? Yeah, he pushed them to the Jordan uh, border. He pushed them to the Egyptian border. They're still there. The Arab world is still there. There's still 2 billion more of them. And guess what? Tomorrow, your technological advancements won't be there no more. Yes, you're in the grave, but your, your grandsons are still here. They now have to be like, hey, we don't have the technological advancements no more. There's all these new AI, and now they built all this thing, and we couldn't we couldn't fathom what was the future. Um, you know, I could tell you all about history, how the wheel can turn. A, a civilization that's on the bottom now is on top. A case in point, the Mamluks. The Mamluks were a slave class who defeated the Mongols. Think about that. Now, there was a lot of circumstance to make it so that the, the Mongols were defeated by a, a slave class, the Mamluks. But still, it happened throughout history. The Mongols were nothing to speak of. Now, look, look what they did. And now today, we don't talk about the Mongols no more. People are strong in one generation and weak in another. They're strong in one era and weak in another. Don't ever forget that. They won't always have military superiority. When that military superiority goes, do you really want to go to the grave and leaving this with your children? I wouldn't want to go to the grave and leave my children with all the enemies surrounding them 
you know, I, I'm a big proponent of peace, making peace. We can't coexist. We've coexisted in the past. Saying that we cannot coexist is, a, is, a, is ridiculous. It's, it's a sunnah to coexist. Actually, I would I would argue that the first the first um, constitution in history was between the Prophet Ali Salam and the people of Medina, the people of Yathrib at the time. That was the first actual constitution where everybody can live in their own religion, their own st their own way of life, but we coexist. People might argue against that, but I think that's the official first one where we put everybody to live autonomously, fairly. You govern your own selves. We're governing our own selves. And here's how we're going to coexist. A true coexistence. We've That's the sunnah. Think about the, the, the treaty of Hudaybiyah. You study that, and then you tell me we can't coexist. Literally, literally, the Prophet ﷺ was dealing with pagans. Now we're dealing with fellow monotheists. They trace their roots back to Abraham ﷺ, like we do. How dare you say we can't have peace? Of course we can have peace. Now, do I think we can have peace with Netanyahu? No, Netanyahu is an extremist terrorist group. His, his government's a terrorist group. I, in, my, in my opinion, they're arguably the worst terrorist group today because they, they listen, it's not me saying this. Look, I define terrorist group as you break international law. If you break international law, Khalas, you're a terrorist. Okay, because we're, we the whole world came together after World War II and said, look, never again. We're never going to do these atrocities. They made peace agreements with, you know, major nations made peace agreements. You think the Prophet Ali Salam wouldn't have loved the Geneva Convention? Of course, he would have been at the forefront of the Geneva Convention. He was doing it before it was called Geneva. He was doing it a thousand years before, more than a thousand years before. He was making it popular. He was saying, look, let's have peace treaties together. Refusing a peace treaty is it's basically an act of war. You don't want to have peace. You don't want to coexist. Netanyahu is refusing peace treaties. He, he People don't know this, but he, he brags about it, empowering Hamas. He put Hamas. People, you don't like Hamas? Well, guess who put Hamas in power? And it's not some secret. I don't have access to secret files. The man brags about it. The man brags about it. It's open. It's, it's, he says it openly. He was bragging. He says, look, if I, I'm putting Hamas in, in power that way, they'll never have peace. Well, the, Hamas won't accept a two-state solution. This is their first charter. And therefore, you know, because the, before that, it was the PLO, secular, uh, secular leaders. They had secular leaders. Think about that mm -hmm. <clears throat> to deal with. But they want a two-state solution. Netanyahu doesn't want two-state solution. He doesn't want coexistence. We can't have coexistence with the extremist government of Netanyahu. And like I was saying before, international law, the ICC, not the ICJ, the ICC, International Criminal Court, did an did a investigation, a five-year investigation in Israeli war crimes. This is before October 7th. And they found them guilty of multiple war crimes, including using white phosphorus. Like, using white ph phosphorus, you're basically bur burning people alive, FYI. They found them guilty, but they said, they, they reported it, but nothing came about because they're a toothless organization. Why? Because the U.S. will protect Israel forever, you know, unconditionally. These are, these are I'm, I don't want to open up too many topics at once. My, my point being is this, is that the people might not know this, but the Israeli government right now is ultra right wing, ultra white, right wing. They're more, they're, they're more extreme than Hamas. Literally, Itamar Ben-Gavir says that all of them are terrorists. The whole two million of them. We should kill them all. He initially there's there's reports about this that he initially tried to appeal to Netanyahu to not distinguish between civilian and uh, militant. And Netanyahu said he would, but obviously he they don't. Okay, anybody who thinks that uh, Israel doesn't kill civilians, I'm sorry, I have a bridge to sell you. I have a bridge to sell you. I literally saw a video of a of a woman walking with a f holding. A four-year-old daughter, her four-year-old daughter's hand walking, and she was hit by a sniper. <clears throat> where is the court martial? Where is where is the punishment? Where is the no that can't happen? Uh, look at the look. There count. Look, we're not dumb. We have eyes. We see. We watch social media. One representative of the Israeli government was saying, "Well, you don't know how those children got under the rubble. How insulting! How insulting! Oh, this building spontaneously collapsed." You're bombing the region and you're telling us we don't know how this child was buried under the rubble? It's absolutely disgusting. Imagine, for the people out there listening, imagine one of your loved ones walked into a bank and the bank was being robbed and there was a group of men, two, three men with machine guns and the police come and say, you know what? We're just going to bomb it. Let's use a 2,000 pound bomb. And we bomb the whole area. We kill everybody in there. And then you say, man, I had my I had my loved ones. I had my wife. I had my children. I had my, my brother, my sister, my cousin. They work. And then they tell you, well, you know, they were being used as human shields. So we had to take them out. I'm sorry. We had to take them out. Like this is a, there's too many banks being robbed all the time. It's, it's a disgusting 
excuse that's unacceptable. We wouldn't accept it if we were, if if Hamas was doing that to the Israelis. I wouldn't accept it. If you're telling me I don't accept the Hamas bombarding uh, civilians randomly like that, I completely uh, I find it to be wrong. We have to be consistent on both sides. I think Muslims should voice this opinion. It's haram. It's completely against the Sunnah, killing innocent civilians. It's completely incorrect. If Netanyahu was a man, if he was brave, he would tell Hamas, look, take me instead of the hostages. If he was a true leader, he would say, look, take me. Give me back all the hostages. Now take me. Take me and my, my group of extremists. Uh, uh, and we'll fight you. I'll, 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 you know, I come from a world when you have a problem with somebody, you sign a contract, man, you fight them face to face, man to man. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't happen much often. <laughs> no, it doesn't happen. Politicians, look, that's why I'm not a big fan of politicians. Okay. And I understand, you know, war is different. I get it. I'm not, not, I'm not that naive, but I'm just expressing a sentiment here. Yeah. A lot of these world leaders are cowards. They use your life like it's nothing. Children are dying. Women are dying. People are dying to them. It's nothing. They're living rich. And it happens. it's happening on both sides. They're living rich in the lap of luxury. And they're happy. And they're they're comfortable. Netanyahu's son, where is he? He was in Florida when, when they deployed the Israeli soldiers. He's in Florida. He's not sending his son. These militants never send their sons. They're sending your sons, my sons. Muslims and Jews should be an excellent representation of morality and justice and we're not doing a good job of it we have to teach the world morality and justice but first we have to be moral ourselves you know that's why me i'm very against going anything that goes against the sunnah this is not the sunnah you know this is not the correct way but yeah i think there needs to be a, a coach for us a spiritual reawakening you know the prophet sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa alayhi told us that he was sent to perfect moral character mm -hmm. so that's why he's amongst us and we've we've sort of siloed the way of the Prophet and we have entered into a realm where we're going to try to do or get whatever we want using religion when it is convenient, you know, convenient for us. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we run into these situations. So, I mean, look, we're all in agreement. We 100% are in full, uh, you know, hand in hand with the Palestinians that they have the absolute right to exist and absolute right to beautiful futures. Mm -hmm. and every human being should be able to attain the question is you know how it's the how here you know how do we how do we people also forget you know i i, the, I love how shmuli likes to say oh we're a democracy we're the only democracy in the middle east first of all you're a rabbi jews are supposed to have a kingdom you're not yeah. supposed to be a democracy like he's a rabbi yeah. he's talking about oh you guys the middle east doesn't give lgbt rights well have you what have you done with the torah hmm. what have you done with it the Torah tells you it's haram to be LGBT. Now, I don't believe you should, we should kill them or persecute them. That's a different story. Okay. No, I'm not saying that, but it's haram. It's a sin to be that. Now he's saying, look, we're openly, but are you calling yourself rabbi? He's not a rabbi. He's more of a secularist. Okay. Let's call it what it is. Let's be honest. He's a secularist. He believes in democracy, but I don't believe Israel is a democracy because a democracy, it's the people who choose the government. Israel chose its people. He said, look, you brown people go over here. We're going to displace you. This is part of their mission statement, by the way. We're going to move you out. Today, it's in their charter to build as many to build as many settlements as possible. There's nobody in the world who could justify settlements. There's nobody in the world. It's one of the most savage uh, things that goes on in the world today. And it's incredible how anybody could even fathom that this is defensible. It's indefensible. The whole world condemns it. But anyways, that's a top, another topic. There are, there are, they are a reverse democracy. Let me tell you why. They placed a government that got rid of people. And the people that agree with the government got a vote. And now today they boast, oh, there's almost 2 million Arabs that live with us. Yes, but they have to forever be a minority. Yeah. It's in your constitution. They have to be forever a minority. Should they ever grow, what's going to happen to them? First of all, they're already harassed. There's Jewish-only neighborhoods. They are segregated. Their schools don't get any funding. Their neighborhoods get no funding. They're second-class citizens. They try to hide that from us, but we know that very well and true. There are sidewalks and roads that are for Jews only, buildings for Jews only, et cetera. There is, there is an apartheid. There is a segregation at all levels in that area at all levels some are worse than others yes but at all levels and i'll tell you something that's not a true democracy a true democracy would have said look we're going to give everybody a vote there's there's a, today there's about as many palestinians as are jews if you truly believe in democracy why are you segregating one race imagine we did that in the us imagine we said look all the mexicans and the blacks we're going to put them in this neighborhood and they're going to govern themselves we're going to build a wall around them we're going to we're going to control their water source their food source we're going to call them human animals. We're going to subjugate them to our laws. They're going to have to go through checkpoints. We're going to slowly take parts of their land. We're going to control them at, at will. We're not going to give them an airport. We're not going to give them uh, any freedoms. We're not going to let them have basic textbooks, etc. We're going to limit them in every which way we see we see desirable. 
You know, even the Gazans are limited noodles. There are times where noodles, you know, like they send back eight trucks because there was a pair of scissors, there's scissors in the eight trucks. What do you, you think they're going to, they're going to take over Israel with scissors? Like they, they send back the whole entire eight truck. Start, people are starving. Children are starving to death. And no, like water for purification tablets are not allowed. Why? They want you to get a disease. Yeah. Like it's so vicious what's happening. I would be embarrassed to, to say that I, I, I support the state. Now, I also say I'm embarrassed. I, I don't support Hamas. I don't support the illegal, the haram things that they did. Everything else I do support. I do, I do support their right to fight for their liberties. But they have to do it within the realm of the sunnah, within the confines of the sunnah. Now, what I was saying is they're, they're so subjugated. We would never fathom that doing that in the U.S. and then call ourselves a democracy. Yeah, we... We, we we took a class of people we don't like, we put them aside, and then we call ourselves a democracy. What a what a hypocr what what hypocrisy to call that democracy. What it really is, it's a military base for the USA. That's really what it is. They're so scared that the Arab world gets together. They're so scared they're gonna patrol us, they're gonna put a military base. They have over a hundred military bases around the world, all to make sure that they control the resources of the world and they call it democracy. It's not a democracy, it's a lie, it's a joke, it's a it's a I, I laugh at it. And a rabbi who calls for a democracy is not really can't be really a rabbi. I mean, you're supposed to be a kingdom and you're supposed to wait till the Messiah comes back to turn you back into a kingdom. I mean, that's a that's a debate for another day. But I mean, he's praising himself for, for being a democracy, really? Like, I don't know. I mean, I just find that to be where where do you feel this all goes, Coach Fraz? What do you see in the next Look, 10 it's years? inevitable? It's happened in his in history, it's gonna happen again. The technological gap is going to decrease over time. It's already happening. Now, drones are, are, are the way to fight. And even who these have drones. We're talking about a third world country can have access to drones. Israel, if you notice, every time their world, their leaders are talking, it's always about, we're going to bomb you. It's always threat, 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 threat. It's always kill, kill. We're going to be so vicious, you're going to regret it. And I'll tell you something a history professor told me once upon a time. He told me the West has one fatal flaw. The USA, especially, he ringed out the USA. He said, look, when the bodies start to pile up, they lose the support of the masses. Mm. Vietnam, you know, my history teacher told me, he's telling me, they didn't lose one single battle. People think, oh, they lost the Vietnam War. Indeed, they did. But they didn't lose any of the battles. They lost because too many bodies were piling up, too many American bodies, and the people back home were like, why are we sending our children there? They started protesting. They're not going to vote for people who are pro-war, et cetera, et cetera. They got tired of this war. Why? Because on this side of the world, we have Big Macs, we have movie night, we have all, this, all these luxuries. We're living good here. Why am I going to send my son to go kill and die in the jungles of Vietnam? And he said, look, because once the bodies start piling up, they always lose support. The government loses support. So he says, look, that was their fatal flaw always. And I hadn't seen Afghanistan then, but then Afghanistan happened. And I started remembering my high school teacher. Mm -hmm. He was talking, we we're talking about geopolitics and he was saying, look, once the bodies start piling up, they find an extra strategy. And you know what? When I saw them pull out of Afghanistan, I remember that. I was like, you know what? The body started piling up. The, 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 it's costing money. You know, here's the thing people have to understand. America goes to war because people get rich. American few private citizens get crazy rich. These these politicians get incredibly rich. They they invest in defense and then they go to war and then their stock market skyrockets and they get rich. The rich get richer, my friend, with war. They they rob the world of resources on one side. They bankrupt the country. They cause a huge amount of debt for the for the taxpayer. But them themselves, the politicians, get incredibly rich. They're in control. They're at the helm. They make themselves rich. They plunder the world. They get you cheap hamburgers for a few years. And then all of a sudden, you're happy. You vote for them. And they keep, after World War II, you know, before World War II, the, the U.S. was in a Great Depression. Now they're living large, man. You want to live in the U.S., you have a nice home. You have, uh, you know, a chicken, a whole bucket of chicken for five bucks. Somebody's suffering. For, for me to get a whole bucket of chicken for five bucks delivered to my door, something's wrong in the world, you know, because they're exploiting they're col they're colonizing the world and they're calling it democracy they're calling it freedom fries their their propaganda is very strong they call it liberty they call it that they liberty i'm putting in quotes for people who might be listening to this they liberated iraq by killing a million of them is iraq more liberal liberated today are they more liberated they abandoned iraq why bodies started piling up they abandoned afghanistan why bodies started piling up let me tell you something about what's happening in israel 
Israel is threatening everybody. The bully in the schoolyard. If you look at me funny, man, I'll punch you. And he wants to dominate everybody. Well, guess what? Take the most dominant UFC champion in history. After a while, he can't even win a fight. Hmm. The strongest, I've seen it. This guy's unbeatable. People think he's unbeatable. I, I, in my mind, because I have so much more experience in fighting, I'll say, look, it's a matter of time, guys. Nobody's unbeatable. Look, give him a few years. He can't throw. Even Khabib's going to have to retire. Even GSP has to retire. Even Anderson Silva, one day, he can't beat a guy in the top 10. The same, fighters are a microcosm of the world. The nations are a macrocosm of fighting. That's what it is. They cannot sustain. Tomorrow, somebody's going to discover a way to bypass all their technologies. Far worse than October 7th. And I'm, I don't wish, I'm not saying I wish this. I don't wish death on, on, on innocent people. But the government is a very corrupt and evil government. It wants to, it's killing people. Me, if you want to piss me off, you want to make me angry, kill innocent civilians. Governments want to fight. You guys fight each other. Uh, it's none of my business. I don't, I'm not even that interested. But once you start killing innocent people on both sides, now you're going to get me. You're going to get me pissed off. They cannot sustain their military might. Netanyahu might make it to the grave. He might end up like Mussolini. He might end up like Adolf Hitler. You know, burned alive or possibly escape or whatever. You know, whatever controversy you believe in. One day they're going to lose their military might. And what's going to happen? People are going to be angry. People are going to remember. People are want to want. They're going to want. I hate to say it, but revenge. Mm -hmm. Now I hope innocent people in the future are not. If revenge is not exact exacted upon them, but I I would hate to see the Arab world do that. Of course, I would hope the Arab world to become powerful and be righteous, be good, be moral, like the Prophet Ali Salam when he conquered Mecca. What did he do? He forgave all his enemies. He allowed them to stay or leave with their riches, with their with their golds. One Sahaba said, oh, today's a day of slaughter. He said, no, today's a day of mercy. That's the ultimate goal, I hope, for this, for the Muslim world. You know, they're going to conquer their enemies. They won't be subjugated to their every whim and bombed and killed and murdered. But they won't, they'll end the cycle of violence, inshallah. Ashraz, on that note, I think I'm going to I'm gonna close this podcast today because we talked a lot about everything that's happening between the Palestinians and, and Israel. And uh, you ended on a very beautiful note about the Prophet Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wa Ali. For all our listeners out there, inshallah, we're going to have more conversations with Coach Faraz in the future. As you see, he's a, a treasure trove of knowledge on everything. And so we're going to get into everything. Coach Faraz, thank you so much for your time with us today. Zakalaw khair, brother. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Uh, everyone. Please be sure to go out there and to subscribe to uh, TriStar Gym, uh, Coach Faraz Zahabi's uh, YouTube, inshallah, his YouTube channel. And Coach Faraz, I'll ask you for uh, one favor. If you would give me the honor of allowing me to come out to Montreal one day and being humbled by you on all the mats. <laughs> you train? You I train, train. train a little bit? Inshallah. Yeah, yeah, we'll, lock, no. we'll, we'll lock each other in the cage and we'll, we'll see what happens. <laughs> I'm just kidding. It'll be a pleasure, brother. Inshallah. Inshallah, we'll train together. Thank you so much. Thank you, brother. Thank you so much. Thank you, brother. Thank you, brother.